Activity-based costing has various merits and various drawbacks. Now, as we've alluded to, activity-based costing theoretically is far superior for a lot of organizations compared to traditional absorption costing. However, despite activity-based costing being used by a lot of organizations, it hasn't been implemented by all. And indeed, some have implemented activity-based costing, but then discarded it over a period of time due to the fact they've obviously concluded its drawbacks actually exceeded its merits. So let's have a look at what the different merits and drawbacks could be. So first of all, activity-based costing should help us improve our decision-making. Now, what we mean by that is, obviously, what we say is activity-based costing, first of all, is much more accurate. So if we're a production business working out the cost of making our products, well, it's going to give us a much more accurate overhead cost per unit, which is going to give us a much more accurate production cost per unit. Now, that's going to help us out in terms of setting our prices. It's going to help us uh, sort of determine what products should be produced and in what quantities, so what we often refer to as the product mix decision. And it might even be the case that longer term, it helps us guide actually which products we continue to manufacture and which products we maybe even discontinue. So it should help us out in terms of better decision making. Accuracy, you've got better information on which to make better decisions. Now, it'll also assist us with what we call our cost reduction. And this is just a simple idea that activity-based costing identifies for each activity a cost driver. Now, a cost driver, remember, is the reason we consume resources and therefore spend money in a particular area. Now, it is much easier to save money, i.e. reduce costs, if you know why you're spending it. And so activity-based costing often leads into something called activity-based management. And activity-based management is using the information garnered from an activity-based costing approach to then help us make business improvements such as reducing costs. For example, if we know that our supplier ordering costs is driven by the number of batches we produce, we might take a step back and say, actually, if we produce in bigger batches, we'll produce fewer batches overall, and therefore we'll have to place less supplier orders. So it gives you that information to make some changes. Activity-based costing is also very versatile in that it can be used in non-manufacturing environments. Obviously, we initially put forward as something that can be used by manufacturing businesses, but the idea that we can break the business down into activities, identify cost drivers, etc., is just as applicable in a service organization or indeed a not-for-profit organization as it is in a manufacturing organization. So it's a very versatile approach. However, as we said, there are some drawbacks. Now, because it's a much more complex approach, what we'd have to do is we'd have to invest some money initially implementing activity-based costing, but that complexity as we then use it within the business on an ongoing basis is also going to result in more costs for the business there as well. So things such as uh, installing new information systems, training the staff, it probably mean more staff to actually look after this particular part of the business as well. So you'd have high implementation and ongoing costs. Now, obviously, if there's costs, we've got to make sure the benefits outweigh them. For some organizations, this may well be the case, but for others, it might not be. Also as well, you can never get away from the fact that there'll sometimes be some arbitrary apportionment of overheads. The idea that we can take every single overhead of the business and assign it to a particular activity just simply isn't the case. Businesses will always have general overheads that do, don't relate to anything in particular. Now, if that is the case, the higher proportion of these general overheads, the more really you're just getting back to the real basic approach of apportion overheads as you would do using absorption costing. So it's only really going to work and make a big difference if we have more of the likes of the batch-related overheads or the product-sustaining overheads. If you just have loads of general fixed overheads, activity-based costing really is going to be nullified due to that particular issue. And it's a more complex process, okay? If you imagine a business that doesn't use activity-based costing, implementing it for the first time, there'd be a lot of change management there, a real change in the way things are done. And with that complexity, you've got to then educate different stakeholders. That more complex process, unless that change is managed carefully, can often be the reasons why something like an activity-based costing approach could fail within an organization. So let's take a look at an example which will test whether or not we truly understand the merits and drawbacks of activity-based costing. 
So we've got some statements and these have been made in relation to activity-based costing. And so we need to determine whether or not these statements are true or false. So the first one says using ABC instead of absorption costing should result in less accurate product costs. Next one, activity-based costing can be used in non-manufacturing environments. Next one, ABC is more useful for businesses producing a small range of products. And a final one, ABC is more useful when overheads are large in proportion to direct costs. So we need to work out which of the above statements are correct, which are true, which are false, if you like. And again, we've got a range of possible responses. And so we know two of these statements are correct. We're just trying to work out which of the two are so. So first one, using ABC instead of absorption costing should result in less accurate product costs. Well, that is definitely false. What we know is ABC is a much more complex process. And in a lot of organizations, that deeper dive on overheads, breaking things down into activities, cost drivers, and so on and so forth, should absolutely give us much more accurate product costs, much more accurate overhead cost per unit, which is going to feed into much more accurate product cost per unit. ABC can be used in non-manufacturing environments. It absolutely can. A lot of examples you'll see will be manufacturing orientated, but it could be used in a service business, a charity, whatever. Okay, this concept of overheads, activities and cost drivers is applicable to all organizations. ABC is more useful for businesses producing a small range of products. No, this is false. Actually, ABC will be more beneficial when we have a business which has a diverse product range. The idea that actually we produce loads of different products. Because if we don't have much diversity in the product range, you'll often find the products that we produce, maybe we only produced a couple of products, they'll be very similar in nature. And therefore, they'll place very, very similar demands on the business. When you have a diverse product range, loads of different production techniques, loads of different things that have to happen for the products to be produced. Therefore, ABC will really reflect the demands placed on the business by this very, very different range of products. So that one, not correct. ABC is more useful when overheads are large in proportion to direct costs. Absolutely. Now, remember what we said in the modern manufacturing environment, overheads are a much bigger proportion of our production costs. And this is why, or this is one of the reasons why there's a need for activity-based costing. In traditional manufacturing environment, most of the costs tended to be direct costs, okay, so not overheads. So actually, this small amount which was spent on overheads, we didn't have the need for this detailed analysis. However, when overheads are much larger in proportion to direct costs, well, therefore, if they're much larger, we need to make sure we have a thorough understanding of these costs, the different activities, the cost drivers, what drives them, so therefore we can get accurate production cost per unit. So that final statement was true. And so statement two and statement four were the correct ones, and so therefore that would lead us to the correct answer being D. So let's recap on activity-based costing. So what we know now is it is a more complex approach to absorb overheads into cost units. So if we're a manufacturing business, we're trying to work out the cost of making our products, activity-based costing is a much more in-depth approach as opposed to absorption costing, which will break the production side of our business down into a couple of different departments. ABC, we break it down into activities, which are much smaller scale. We identify cost drivers. It's a much more complex approach, but that complexity, that deeper dive on our overheads should bring us much more accurate information. So what do we need to be comfortable with? Okay, well, we need to be comfortable with the mechanics of activity-based costing, so how we go through that process of actually taking our overheads, assigning them to activities, calculating cost driver rates, and then charging them to our cost objects, such as the likes of our products or customers, whatever it may be. We also should be comfortable with the ABC hierarchy. So how we classify different activities within our business are they unit level, batch level, product sustaining or facility sustaining level style overheads and activities. But also as well, we need to be comfortable with the merits and drawbacks of ABC. Okay, so theoretically, a much more superior process, which a decision making gives us great information to help us control our costs. However, it brings with it added complexity and the costs of actually maintaining this as an approach could be quite substantial.